uh, the scientific practice today and the scientific method responding to the credibility crisis. So uh, there's um, a lot in this talk you guys know, so I'll go very quickly over this first slide, which is we're in the midst of a data deluge. Not only that, but one thing that I want to mention, people have talked about this data deluge a fair amount. Um, these last two points, especially the last one, I think are very important. These massive simulations of the complete evolution of a physical system, uh, like while you're physically varying, while you're systematically varying parameters. So this is decades old, this approach now, but still f filtering into various aspects of science is a new tool. The other thing that I think is underappreciated is that many of our deep intellectual contributions, scientific contributions, are now just encoded in the software. They might be described in the paper, but really this is where the contribution is and it's rarely shared. And many discussions that I hear in policy circles about data, there's not an appreciation of this fact that there's a real shift here and um, very deep contributions are being made through uh, uh, software encoding. Okay, so. This is the second time you've seen this because Tony's talk this morning went through this. So there's a couple of um, people who are concerned, or more than a couple of people who are concerned with uh, the scientific method. So I think there's no controversy about beginning with the ideas of theory back in the days of the Greeks uh, onto empirical experimentation and how these support and, uh, and if in effect um, reinforce each other moving to large-scale computational simulation, as I just described, and then data-driven scientific <coughs> discovery. So there's, um, there's another uh, approach, which my advisor, David Donahoe, uh, describes it this way. Um, it, it, it doesn't argue with Jim Gray. It's just uh, he has a different take on it. So branch one, our deductive method, mathematics and formal logic, our empirical branch, and branch two, statistical analyses of controlled experiments and so on, hypothesis testing and so on. Branch three, uh, our computational branch, large scale simulation. So he stops here because um, it's unclear that it, he's not willing to accept this as a branch of the uh, this third branch of the scientific method. He still sees it as a potential branch, and I agree with this. Um, potential third branch. So let me explain what I mean. Okay, so the central motivation of the scientific method is to root out error. This is what the first branch is about, the second branch is about. Deductive branch in mathematics, it's well known that you're not publishing a mathematical result without a uh, proof, and what, it, what comprises a proof, there are very clear standards for. I mean, you, anyone who's done any math has run into that wall a few times. The empirical branch, the we have the machinery of hypothesis testing, structured communication of methods and protocols, and they've evolved the machinery to um, essentially standardize what it means to um, publish a result in that particular case. So the assertion is that computational science as practiced today doesn't generate reliable knowledge in the same way that the deductive branch and the empirical branch do. Now these are hundreds of years old, right? It's something of an unfair comparison, but I think it's useful for framing the way that we're thinking about these problems. So the, the thesis is computation... Just to clarify, does, yeah. does, does he believe that the empirical... These articles that have been written about sort of the failure of science even in the empirical branch lately? I don't know what his opinion is on that. No, that's an interesting, that's an interesting point. I, and, and, and there's much, I, so it's very interesting and there's much more that can be said. Like, um, um, so a colleague of mine at Berkeley has written a paper that basically argues that Gray's four branches are all self-reinforcing as part of the same sort of experimental procedure, which seems to me very um, likely. But it doesn't change the point that as we become more computational, we still have to develop the same standards as we've seen in the other branches is the main point. So that is what I was about to say. Computational science must develop standards for reproducibility before it can be considered a third branch of the scientific method. So what um, I am going to argue... I was yes. going to do any research on climate modeling and uh, galaxy creation. Oh, what do you mean? In terms of sharing I code? Mean, there are well, reasonable things for people to do research on. Yeah. So actually, and I think that's a valid form of research. It's not the same as deductive and critical, but surely it's worthwhile. Right, so I think, would you argue that it doesn't fall under the rubric of computational science? Yeah, I, I think yeah, so. Reproducibility without numerical accuracy in, in large scale simulations is irrelevant. Well, so, so there's you many. Talk, you talked to Patrick Roku, who, who developed the AIAA computational policy as way as long ago as 1989. It's a very different type of activity. 
Well, that, that's right. So, so that will come out later in the talk as well. But there are a number of movements now. Um, there's one at Berkeley, for example, where they're trying to re-implement uh, uh, climate modeling code in an open way so that it can be at least parsed and run on other systems and reread. And a uh, number of arguments that I had heard in the climate science community is it is very difficult to, for us to open our code. I mean, it's sort of dense Fortran routines. And um, so they have gone and actually replicated this in, I believe they did it in Python, but I'm not 100% sure, and found that it wasn't actually that much trouble. So there's, there, there are movements to do this type of computational science in an open way. So I don't think it's impossible. Okay, I wanted to throw in a slide here about some of the terminology discussions that have come up in a number of talks. Justin Jarrett's, this came up. Um, so we're talking about these words, right? Replicability, reproducibility. I also hear repeatability thrown around in discussions of um, um, sort of um, reliability of science and computational results. Replicability, Gary King talked about this in 1995. I think what it means now was what Bill's talk actually outlined, where you're really just regenerating results from existing code and data, literally replicating them without an intellectual contribution. Uh, reproducibility is starting to mean this independent recreation of results. Maybe you don't have the existing code or the existing data, or maybe you do and you modify it, but there's some independence going on there. It's not a question of just hitting return and having numbers come back to you. Um, I use reproducibility to mean this version of replicability, uh, so there's confusion about this. I just wrote a very short little editorial on this issue of terminology that came out in Amstat News at the beginning of July, so I talk about maybe ways that we could usefully use these words. Um, repeatability, rerunning experiments to determine the sensitivity of results when underlying measurements are retaken. So in my opinion, it doesn't have much room in this discussion, but it, it sneaks in. Um, I gave a talk in a scientific computing group a couple of years ago, and I started talking about reproducibility, and they just had, they were like, what do you mean? Do you mean verification? Do you mean validation? Like, what are you talking about reproducibility? This is such a foreign word. So uh, we could be more precise in what we're talking about in terms of verification, accuracy, which with a computational model delivers the results of the underlying mathematical model. How have we digitized, in some sense? Validation, the accuracy of a computational model with respect to the underlying data. So we have model error, observational error, measurement error. Um, but these don't seem to really capture what we've been talking about in this workshop. So um, this is one way we could clarify the, the terminology. Okay, so uh, I've been watching the Journal of the American Statistical Association, their June issue since 1996. And I've been interested in how many of those articles use some kind of computational aspect. They have some kind of either simulation results or some data-driven results in there. And then um, do they tell me where I can get the code or how I could actually verify those results? And so it's since to at least 2009, everybody does something computational in the Journal of um, the American Statistical Association. And then we see these, whether the code is available, increasing but slowly, right? Nobody talked about it in the mid-90s, like 9%, 2006, 2009, we were up to 16%. And I just looked at this one today, because the June issue just, is just out online, and we're up to 21%, thankfully, it didn't drop. So we're getting there. So I started wondering, well, maybe we just shouldn't do anything and just <laughs> let this continue. But, but I, have, I had a very loose um, definition of whether code was publicly available, whether they mentioned where I could get the code in the article. If there was some kind of, like they gave me a website or they pointed me to the R package or something like this. That's all it took to, to get counted there. I mean, do you worry about things, many of these presumably use things like MATLAB plotting and things like that. That's um, commercial code, right? Almost all of these use R because this is statistical community. I didn't happen to see MATLAB in there, but also like of the, um, you know, 79% here, I didn't know what software they were using, so they could have been using MATLAB in, in their plots. Does it matter to your uh, need to have code publicly available if people do use some commercial software? Yeah, that's a, it's a, that's a great question, and I think you can extend the question to all the discussion we've had about the cloud, because we're using commercial clouds too, so we've got this dependency on, um, on the commercial uh, sector. Uh, I, think it, I think it would be ideal if we could open source everything and you could dig down to the bottom. Um, 
the good thing about um, NatLab is that this, much of the work and the um, innovations are captured in scripts, right? And so it's a question of, well, can you dig into, say, the SVD function and see actually how that's running? In MATLAB, you might have some problems in Python or um, R, you could do that, right, in theory. What about things like computation through dynamic scopes? What about them? The well, there are many of them that are commercial. There's also non-commercial. Yeah, and there's many in bio, too. are used by Boeing, for example, like that. Is that something you've got in that? That are black boxes? Yeah. I mean, you know, is it reasonable to have commercial software? Yeah. Uh, well, I do. So, so I think it's reasonable. And I think that argument is one that doesn't stop at commercial software. Like, for example, some of the scientific codes that get used in, say, models of um, Earth's deformation of the Earth's crust, for example, they're hundreds of thousands of lines long. And so it's, in some sense, the same argument. We can't read them. Right, so they're not something that, so, so, what, so the way the discussion has evolved so far is, well, then there are um, a series of tests that we can subject the code to and then understand how it's running. Maybe it's not as nice as reading a short five-line script or something, but at least you can hit the code with something and understand its properties. Right, I mean, really, when you have hundreds of thousands of lines of code, you're stuck with this in any event. Do you want to say something, Jim? Even if you write it yourself, every last simulation you do has to have a V and V activity. And V and V and CFD verification is are you solving the equations right? Mm -hmm. And validation is are you solving the right equations? So, it's a different type of verification and validation. It is. But well, well, what I'm saying is, in the hands of a skilled operator, black box code can still be checked. And it's part of the training that you need to give to people. I mean, that is how physicists, for example, the codes are millions of lines long and they don't look at the code, but they do the test to see if it yeah. responds in the right way. And, and, and yeah. they, you know, so. yeah. But that's because you have knowledge of the physical system. Yeah. Well, yeah I mean, to some extent, the, you know, the guy who the, 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 um, the physicists who managed to build a Bose Einstein condensate got published. Their work was considered to be reproducible, but they don't, nobody expects that you could do it. Absolutely. The other people working on Bose Einstein condensates could. So, in, in my, my mind, it, it would be a question of whether, you know, can somebody else with a CFD code yes, with they handle that kind of information, can they reproduce it? Uh, and that's, but it won't be bit compatible. Yeah. So, it is it absolutely good with Victoria. It's not the same as your branch one and branch two, but it is a valid form of research, and I, I and therefore I would question whether putting the framework up to, well, it's like a straw man, you're comparing. The, the, this is, sorry, this is my tactic in the talk a little bit. I do, you, if you use a wind tunnel, each wind tunnel has its own noise characteristics, which for certain types of problem means that it's very difficult to reproduce. Yeah, yeah. But I do have a section coming up for, for everybody on, on open questions in reproducibility and some critical analysis so we can dig in more. No, don't apologize. Okay. No, no, don't. So there is, uh, so reproducibility. So I'm back to using the term that we're all familiar with in the context that we're all familiar with, not, notwithstanding my note on terminology. Uh, and I wanted to mention, so this is, the, this is the one that has been in basically every talk, right, that we're advertising our scholarship with publication. I also wanted to draw attention to Gary King, who's a political scientist, um, professor at Harvard, uh, is, is in the social sciences community. In 1995, he published the replication standard holds that sufficient information exists with which to understand, evaluate, and build upon a prior work if a third party can replicate the results without any additional information from the author. So that's the standard he forwarded in his community that um, is largely accepted. It's not necessarily acted on, but, but this framing is largely accepted. And um, this one, it's saying something slightly different when it's talking about the release of the complete um, software development environment. Okay, so this slide is supposed to be just an overwhelming blizzard of words. You're not supposed to read it. What I'm doing is pointing out how, uh, and this workshop is one example of how these issues in reproducibility are coming up in many different fields seemingly independently now. And uh, we are, the, the discussion is gaining more voices. So one thing is, um, uh, 
our, <laughs> our session and uh, at the talks at ICAM. Geosciences had a discussion or a special session this year on reproducibility. Uh, biometrics, they're con very concerned about what happened with the, the Duke trials and there are outright calls for reproducible research here and discussions of how you can do it. AAAS, I did a session on, in February on the digitization of science and reproducibility. Um, computational sci science and engineering, we had a Yale roundtable data and code sharing in 2009, the Sigma conferences we've already talked about. Um, NSF OCS, so, so um, Tony mentioned this, report on Grand Challenge Communities had a number of discussions of reproducibility in their Institute of Medicine. Um, they have a committee now, a review of omics-based tests for predicting patient outcomes in clinical trials. It's also a result of what happened with Duke and trying to review um, what went wrong in terms of scientific oversight. So it's coming up from many different, many different fields. Uh, I wanted to uh, pre also present, it's just one um, table from a paper that I wrote about a survey I did of computational scientists in um, 2010, so I, I think I actually did the survey in 2009, so what I did is I surveyed the NIPS community, so machine, that's one of the top machine learning conferences, and uh, I just sent them a cold email, uh, I mean I had some involvement with the community, but I just sent them a cold email and asked them to fill out a web form. I was interested in um, your recent NIPS paper, did you share the code, why or why not, did you share the data, why or why not, trying to understand um, these factors. So this, this has been discussed in a number of talks and I think people's instincts are largely right. It's time to document and clean up that is the top of the list on both and I had one person even comment that that's, you know, it's so important it's on a log scale compared to all the other uh, factors. Uh, people don't want to become, um, you know, an IT uh, person helping people install and so on and deal with that end of um, uh, releasing their software. They're worried about attribution. So it's interesting that um, theft and so on is not that high, but they're more worried about wasting their time documenting and cleaning it up. Uh, and thing that was surprising to me was how high these IP barriers actually figured in my work as a grad student and so on. We thought about copyright issues because we were releasing software um, and we sort of knew about them, but there wasn't, that wasn't anything that really kind of permeated our way of doing our work. But for the people in the NIPS community, they're really thinking about this. I mean, it's a more medical community than what, than what I was involved in too. Uh, there's regulations that they need to, like HIPAA for example. Um, they could get scooped, competitors may get an advantage and then they just don't know where to store it, right? Um, so this, this dovetails, I think, with people's instincts from the discussions that I've been hearing today. Okay, so let me talk a little bit about some of the legal barriers. Um, the first one, and I believe the most pervasive one, is actually the copyright barrier. Uh, the reason it's pervasive is because this is something that affects every computational scientist. So copyright is something that originates in our Constitution. You can see from the first quote, um, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 8 promote the progress of science. We have limited times, to, um, authors have limited times to, uh, with an exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. So uh, the key point here is that our original expression of ideas falls under copyright by default. Now that means that papers, code, figures, data, anytime there's been an idea and an original expression of it, that's something that automatically the copyright falls on the creator. And copyright means that nobody else can reproduce the work, which is what ideally as a scientist I would love someone to check my results, right? Nobody else can prepare derivative works based upon my original work. So um, that also is something that works against our scientific norms. It would be lovely if someone took my work and adapted it to their uh, problems and we're able to extend it or uh, build on it in some way. This is something we want. So both of these are against our scientific norms and it's um, high impact. So this lasts life of the author in 70 years, which is um, sort of in software and science terms forever, right? So there are some um, exceptions and limitations, but they don't cover the vast majority of the scientific work that we do and we publish. So copyright is, a, is quite, um, quite nefarious. So Richard Stallman noticed that this was a problem for people writing software um, first and he, well, um, he had a reaction to it first and what he did was write the um, GNU public license as a reaction to the fact that the terms of use under which I was going to share my code are dictated by the law 
and perhaps that we like to have different terms of use to share under which we're sharing our code. So since then, there's been a proliferation of hundreds and hundreds of licenses that um, allow users to set terms of use that are much more permissive than copyright, that will allow people to download, run, modify, republish, whatever it is on the code. Like this, there's a complete um, suite of licenses that you can choose from. Um, this was adapted by Larry Lessig and co-founders through Creative Commons into um, digital artistic works that are sh shared on the web. For example, if you're sharing images or you're sharing um, movies or something like this, like the recordings, then um, all the open source software licenses didn't really fit what you were trying to do, yet you had copyright on them. So how could you share those on the web in terms other than the default copyright terms? So Creative Commons um, came up with a series of um, another suite of licenses that allowed users to set terms of use, like for example, if you are willing to share with just attribution, or you would like to share um, but not have commercial use, or you would like to restrict the, the, um, uh, the creation of derivative works from your work, and also share alike. So those are the four. Here they are. So those, th that's basically the four that they offered. And so then they have um, downloadable terms of use that you can just attach to the works. So this was, this was very interesting to me because um, none of this addressed the problems that we have as computational scientists, right? Some of our work could be thought of as possibly artistic. I mean, we've got figures, and they're certainly very beautiful, right? And we've got text that we write, and maybe it, so you could shoehorn that into literature. But, um, but it doesn't really fit. And so I thought, well, maybe there should be some guidelines about what we could do to release our work in a way that is um, consonant with our norms. Like, for example, as scientists, we generally would um, be very happy for people to use our work, reuse it, check it, but they really should be giving us attribution or citing us, right? So that's essentially our norm. We're very liberal with our work uh, that we publish. So in order to match this, I developed the reproducible research standard, and the idea was, well, let's use Creative Commons attribution licensing on um, the aspects of our work that could be considered artistic, right? So the paper or the um, figures and so on. Now this is up to, this, this is assuming we have authorship rights over the work. So there's many ways in which we won't when we interact with journals and so on. But in an ideal, this is in, in some sense describing an ideal situation. So code components release them under extremely lightweight license like modified BSD, something that is attribution only in some sense. And then release data to the public domain or attach an attribution license. Data is um, a little bit complicated in the sense that raw facts themselves have no copyright, no default copyright on them, but the Supreme Court has ruled that original selection and arrangement of these facts can have a copyright attached to them by whomever is doing the original selection and arranging. And uh, so what that means in our context as computational scientists is not clear to me, um, but it does mean that the data sets that we build and put together may not be free of copyright. There could be some kind of residual copyright in there from the um, you know, intellectual work that we've put into building them. So um, Creative Commons approach to data has been, well, this is a uh, difficult topic, there's no case law to guide us, so maybe data should just go right into public domain. Um, I am also thinking if there is a residual copyright in there, you, attaching an attribution license could actually help people um, feel maybe more comfortable releasing their data set if there's uh, um, terms of use or attribution. So the idea here is to mimic our norms as closely as possible, which current law doesn't. Yeah, Michael. In a nutshell, you say why you could use GPR, why you could use GPR Right. So um, I have an opinion about that. So I don't think so. GPL Stallman's GPL came out of his motivations in creating an open source software community. Right. And so when he developed this, one of the things that he put into it was this notion of share alike, which I briefly mentioned in the context of Creative Commons. So share alike, um, what it does is it does two things. It says, if you use this work under GPL, you have to use this license on your work. And not only that, but now this GPL license is going to cover your, your work in its entirety, like all the libraries and so on. So it's very expansive over your work. 
Now, this is, this is something that made sense in the context of building an open source community because there was, um, if you were creating and releasing software, you can feel very threatened by um, large firms or other entities that could come in and sort of you know, put a thin wrapper on it and then resell it or something like this. So there was this idea that they didn't want this to happen. They wanted to sort of grow the amount of open source software there. And so hence this inclusive sense of share alike. I don't think that we are situated the same way that Stallman was in the, in the nascent open source community was. Uh, we as scientists are um, creating a public good in the sense of scientific knowledge, right? So rather than trying to be discriminatory about who uses it, we have a tradition of being more open about it. So share alike puts an extra restriction or an extra terms of, term of use onto um, our scientific output that historically hasn't been there. And so that's a new shift. And so I think that we're better off doing something more along the lines of sticking with our norms and just essentially asking for attribution rather than imposing, imposing something else. Yeah? What do you mean the code? You mean the code specific to a specific experiment, right? Not tools or... Because uh, I, I agree with your, your point of using the DST for... And the code for this paper is DST license. And you do whatever you want. As, as far as you start with. But uh, I don't think that helps with tools, for instance. It doesn't help tools? I mean, uh, if you publish your tool, the minimum that you could get back is if people get a modified version. Yeah. That's not proprietary, right? Yeah, well, I mean, hopefully you get attribution right even from the tools. And uh, if other scientists are using it, and you can get the citation. I would assume. So the, the thing like uh, with the GPL is that I say, I have a colleague at Microsoft, you will never touch some code that I wrote that was GPL because it's going to contaminate this stuff. Yeah. Right? So there's lots of people that are not going to touch GPL code because it is getting contaminated. There's another point yeah. of the GPL code as well, which is there's not just one GPL license. So if, you, if I need two pieces of GPL code um, that have slightly different licenses, there's no way, because they're both telling me that this is the license you have to use on your product, so I can't mix. So there's, that's another drawback. So, I mean, if, if people are going to make the argument that GPL is actually really helping the sciences and we should shift towards it, I think the argument, it's a cost-benefit argument that needs to be made. Yeah, Ian. I mean, I think there's, there's two distinct things. GPL is the share alike right. thing that's the problem. And whether that's in GPL, whether that's in your code because of GPL, or whether it's in your, your, your media components, um, the share alike has some deleterious effects, um, particularly if you want people to uh, uh, remix what you've done, because then you can't, you can get conflicting um, licenses. And, uh, or if, if commercial entity, if you want commercial entities to maybe use it in the future, they won't touch anything with share alike type license. Yeah, that, that's right. That's, that's sort of the crux of the argument. And, and I also think it's somewhat, it, it, that's a new thing for scientists. It's like, uh, it, it's, I, I don't know of others, like we have sort of a very peer oriented community and it's very strange to take an order from another scientist about what license I'm going to, maybe I need a different license in my context and I need to work with something else. And, the other scientist is telling me that I have to use this particular license, but, yeah. So what do you think about LGPL? LGPL, well, LGPL doesn't have the share alike in it, right? So in, in my opinion, I think that's a vast improvement. So I think in, in one of the versions of the slides, I actually list LGPL as a possibility. Yeah, I, I, being an engineer, my university was keen to do spin apps, right? And so you had academics <coughs> who had no idea of the difference of licenses. And, you know, they like me, it's, it's publicly funded, it's reasonable, it should be in the public domain. But they thought open source equals GPL. And Absolutely. So they could have done this thing, they wanted to be the next MATLAB or the next Fluent or whatever it is. And they could put all the hours they like and get venture capital. But anything they did, if they chosen GPL, go back. GPL was designed to stop commercial software yes. existing in some yeah. sense. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree with all that. Well, I, I, I agree with this. Okay, I mean, that's, that's what they specifically claim. Well, it works. It I mean, it, it, it works. Right? It, it includes closing. It, it, okay. includes, it includes commercialization uh, as a better hat. You can offer a service on it. Right. 
Right. It's not. It's not. It's not the, it's not the case that DPL software can't be resold. It certainly can. But one of the motivations, Tony's exactly right. Juliana's exactly right. Like these companies won't touch DPL, right? Because it opens everything. So that, in that sense, it stops this from being sucked into a commercialized structure. Okay. So let's come back to this so point. Academics should have a choice. If they want to use DPL, that's fine. So I have no problem with that. I just explain the difference between BSD and DPL. And Tony, you're reminding me of a point here too, like um, clearly this is maximal, right? Like if you wanted to put everything out in public domain, that certainly would satisfy the reproducible research standard. It's a question of getting it out there. Um, okay. So uh, I wanted to talk about some of the policy that, that, some of the debates that are going on now and uh, some of the impact of previous policy decisions that uh, we may not always be conscious of or thinking about as computational scientists working on our science. Um, so the Bayh-Dole Act was passed in 1980 and there were a couple of motivating ideas behind it. And one is they had this idea that there was an enormous amount of innovation happening in universities that in some sense wasn't seen in the light of day. It was being published in journals and in closed discussions and there was this, this a potential for commercialization, for new firms to be started, for to join existing companies that wasn't happening. And uh, the, other, the other thing that motivated Baidol was um, the funding agencies had very different policies in terms of who owned what IP and so on. So they wanted to restructure, realign those policies so that they made, they were a little more internally consistent. So Baidol Act, but, it, but being passed in 1980, the legislatures, let, the legislators at that time, they had no idea of what was going to happen in terms of the computational um, revolution and they certainly didn't, I don't think they anticipated it coming. And so what happened is um, we are, we're, we're, it, so by Dole basically um, caused the creation of these tech transfer offices and created a system where um, universities would hold the IP rights so that they could license and make money from um, developments within their university. The idea is to promote this kind of um, external communication of the knowledge. But what happened is because of the patentability of code and now the pervasiveness of code, you have this um, by Dole as something of a disruptor of the norms of openness that are... No, it's a more comprehensive piece of legislation. But the way that it's impacting what we are discussing today is in, um, in basically patenting code. Yes, but it didn't prevent you doing a BSD license. Absolutely not. Making a commercial company from that. Absolutely not. Right. So, um, but, but like you said in your last point, this is something that scientists may or may not understand the fine distinctions of. And the tech transfer offices, um, they understand one point that we're talking about. They understand the idea that you can patent some of the um, uh, innovations and then you can license it. They're, they don't understand, or at least they're only beginning to grasp this idea that you could actually release your code openly and you might want to do this as, as a scientist. So the tech transfer officers are speaking one language and, uh, and it's about patents. Um, okay, so this the, so what I would like to do is I, I have, I believe that this possibility of patent causes a delay in revealing code. So patents are supposed to um, cause disclosure of technology, right, like it's open and written in the patent um, application for various reasons. Uh, one I'll get to in the next point. I think that this is an incomplete way to communicate scientific knowledge. Um, but in the meantime, as you're waiting to have your patent approved by the patent office, you might not be comfortable taking a chance in revealing your work because of the possibility of introducing prior art or making it something that's uh, your patent application wouldn't be novel if you did this. So the tendency is for academics who are doing this to sit on code and not reveal it even if they would have otherwise. So there, I think there's some delay in there and I'd like to, I'd like to study that, yeah. In generally the approach that once the patent application is filed that is set as priority date? Yeah, I think that I think you're totally fine to do that. that. Yeah. yeah, I think once, that's fine. Once it's filed, then you can publish. Yeah, but there's still so so that's the interesting so that's why I want to study the delay. Like how much is that? If they um, they have a result that they would have published at time A and they put their patent application in like, you know, A plus one day, then and then they release their code, maybe there's no impact, right? But I don't know what the delay is in terms of getting the application together and when the publication would have come out. And so so it's interesting questions to me. And I think they're sort of open empirically, but they're certainly not speeding things up. Let's put it that way. 
Okay, so there was a case that the Supreme Court heard and ruled on last year, Bilski versus Kapos, and this was a case that caught a lot of public discussion because it was rumored that they would actually deal with the issue of um, business methods patents. Uh, one thing that they did that I think is instructive for us as computational scientists is, um, so Bilski submitted um, methods for calculating risk in certain situations. And the patent was denied and he appealed it and it was denied and he appealed it and it went to the Supreme Court. And the reason the Supreme Court heard it really didn't have anything to do with Bilski. It had to do with, um, they thought that the um, patent court had made a mistake in the test they applied. So they were just going to correct this. So it wasn't really about um, Bilski or the software patents. But what they did do is they did affirm the denial of the patent by Bilski. And one of the points that they used to do that is Bilski had actually written out the mathematics of his um, patent, of his uh, technique and methodology in his patent application towards the end. And patents, of course, um, are on inventions. They're not on abstract ideas. And that's very clear. And so the Supreme Court, and uh, probably all the other cases too, said, well, if you can write it out mathematically, this is clearly an abstract idea, not patentable. So, um, <laughs> so right. <laughs> so, so now, the, what's the lesson, right? If you're applying for a patent, please don't put in the math. So right away, there's some kind of obfuscation that's going to happen there. If you're not, the, I mean, frequently the most clear way we can communicate our ideas is, is giving the, um, the mathematics behind it, of course. Right. OK. All right. So. So, Does people know how stupid that is? No. <laughs> um, I can point you to some literature on this that, that discusses it, but there is, um, there is a, I think, in my opinion, having had a foot in both worlds, there's quite a deep schism between what computational scientists are doing and what the legal world is doing, uh, I think. Uh, I, could, I could talk for hours about this. Okay. So the, the other thing I wanted to mention is there's uh, an act called America Competes, and it was reauthorized in, I think, January of 2011. There's two sections in here which are interesting to our purposes and I believe will forward our agenda in, in, a, in a real way, not just through discussion. The first one, section 103, interagency public access committee is going to be formed to coordinate federal science agency research and policies related to the dissemination, long-term stewardship of the results of unclassified, like non-military research, including digital data and peer-reviewed scholarly publications supported wholly or in, or in part by um, funding from federal science agencies. So we've seen this argument in a couple of talks that when the public is funding your work, um, you may be especially targeted to have your work open to the public. Uh, okay, so what's interesting to me is I added this um, italicization that they're talking about data here. They're not just talking about science in the traditional published sense. So this is new, this is very interesting. Section 104 on federal scientific collections. So the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House shall develop policies for the management and use of federal scientific collections to improve the quality organization access, including online access and long-term preservation of such collections for the benefit of scientific enterprise. This is also very interesting because this is accessing science online, which is a lot of what we're doing. Okay, I wanted to mention there's been a little bit of discussion about funding agency policy. Um, okay, I think actually, I think Tony even mentioned this, that in NSF grant guidelines, they talk about you're supposed to, um, there's an expectation that investigators will share uh, within a reasonable time data, samples, physical collections, other supporting materials, um, encourages uh, grantees to share software, so they're talking about data and software, and inventions and otherwise act to make the innovations they embody widely useful and usable. But this has been here a long time, and the question is, well, how do you enforce it? What does it really mean? So these are open questions. One way NSF is starting to answer that question is, I think everybody in the room knows about the new, new as of, I think, January, peer-reviewed data management plans of this year, uh, two pages, and um, you say what you're going to do with your data. And there's really not much more guidance than that. And I think it's a wonderful opportunity for the NSF to review these plans and have a look at um, what people are talking about in terms of data release, what the priorities are, what the concerns are of the community, and they can get a handle on costs when people start talking about what they're going to do. They can understand whether this is really prohibitively costly to support the sharing of uh, 
data output and code output that comes from their grants. And we also talked about earlier in the workshop um, how this is similar to NIH plans. So NIH in 2003, so many years ago, they have a policy that they endorse the sharing of final research data to serve these and other important scientific goals. Well, um, the, NS the NIH expects and supports a timely release and sharing of final research data from NIH-supported studies for use by other researchers for their big studies, right, more than 500,000. Um, and they would include a data sharing plan. So they, like we, like we discussed earlier, they have something similar. So there's, there's motion here in term, at the policy level. Okay. Um, oh, this Do is... those policies come down to institution -wise? Um, they are, um, there's many different ways that scientists, well, uh, applicants have solved this problem. Like the, uh, Gary King runs the Dataverse Network at Harvard, for example, and they will generate a plan for you, for example. Um, there's Chris Boardman, who also came up in one of the other talks, who's a professor at UCLA. It, as part of one of her courses in the spring, she paired students with um, professors who were uh, creating data management plans to work with them to build it, right? She's in the School of Information. So there's been a number of different approaches, but it's, it's open-ended, right, on, in terms of what it means. But I don't know of any institution that has actually stepped in at the institutional level and said, here's a template. So the data one project, they're building this tool that will help guide people and improve that out by asking questions, you know, that, that the reviewers might get interested in. So I don't know if they release that yet, but they're... I think they've released it, but I haven't looked at it. So the data one is actually uh, publishing a set of data plans. But at NMS at JPG, they actually say some things that they expect to see, but it's not uh, iPad. Okay, so I found oh, the digital curation center in the UK, and you can find that whole set of guidelines for data management plans, which are specifically different for different communities. Right. And I recommend them to NSF and data work, so we'll see what comes out. Yeah, but they didn't look at the work. But the DCC don't have a written policy, they give you guidelines. Yeah, they're just like digital. It's guidelines. It's guidelines. I think they give you a template that you could use. Okay, okay. Randy. I think you should also present that NSF, I think that's kept it intentionally vague at the moment because they want to see what sorts of things come in. and. They plan to, I think, in a couple of years, be more prescriptive about this. So the community has an opportunity to kind of influence how it evolves. So this is exactly I've heard that. Well, I was on a panel recently, and they said basically they did the exact same thing with broader impacts. Right? Originally, broader impacts was completely unspecified. They didn't do anything. And over time, it, it sort of emerged, and they're just sort of following the same picture. I think it's a very challenging view of NSA. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what they plan. Yeah, I mean, yeah we, we, will, we will see but that. I bought, I bought it. Okay, so I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, for better or for worse, revive our earlier discussion. And I wanted to bring up some of the questions that bother me when I think about this issue. Uh, there are probably a lot more than this. So there's um, issues in terms of citation and, con and contributions and acknowledgement. So as we are more computational, of course, there's different ways to contribute to science, right, that emerges at the same time. And um, uh, we don't have effective ways of incorporating this into the um, evaluation standards, right? So I threw this tiny, probably unreadable little snapshot of a paper here, but what the publication is, it's talking about um, uh, a database that was published and I think something like 25,000 people worked on it and the question is, well, can we um, somehow acknowledge all these people who went and annotated some genes and so on and contributed to the database when it's such an enormous amount and how do you cite them? So how do you do this kind of collaborative effort in database building? Um, are there different ways that we would cite or different priorities we would, we would cite uh, that we would put on different types of citation like like a microcitation in uh, a database for annotation and contrib contribution, publishing on the web, publishing in, you know, we know how to do, do it in different articles and with the journal hierarchy. Um, there's been a number of uh, interesting discussions and I'd be interested to hear what you think in terms of citing ideas. This is traditionally what we do. How do we cite data sets and um, uh, the work that's involved in putting together, maintaining, designing, creating data sets. How do we cite code development and creation? Um, who both of these are now um, in 
pillars in terms of scientific discovery that are largely unrecognized, mostly. And so where do they fit into a citation hierarchy and how do we solve that problem? Um, well, versioning, okay, we've had a lot of uh, discussions about that. Uh, we've also seen um, contributions in terms of citizens and citizen engagement and how computational science, openness, reproducibility also engages a much larger audience than what may have happened in, in the past. Um, how do we manage or reward the code development, right? Is there review pre-publication? When do we do this verification? We, we've heard a discussion yesterday um, how biostatistics has taken the approach that that's something that they are giving their um, accepted authors an option to do before publication. Science, has, Science Magazine has been clear to me that that's something they consider um, that happens in the scientific community post-publication. That's when reproduce, reproducibility, replication, validation, verification, all of this happens after as peers then evaluate the work as it's published. So, and, and that's traditionally been the way we've done it for hundreds of years before it became computational. Lots of issues, and we sort of have not talked deeply about them, but they've come up over and over if people have been talking about coding efforts, um, what happens when, you know, code breaks and so on, but lots of solutions have been out there. Um, and platform building is another way of um, incorporating openness and collaboration. So as part of my thesis uh, with, with other people, I put together this platform sparse lab for um, uh, sparse models, essentially, and we did it in about 2005, so it looks kind of old now, but I remember one of the things we did, we would publish papers from our group, put code and data in there, and there was actually a MATLAB GUI that had sliders that would allow you to change parameters on any of the figures, and you could step through the figures and see the code. Um, and then we got an email from uh, researchers at Duke, well, can we just put, your, put our papers in your platform? Sure. So we just sort of incorporated other people, and then this became... Um, a place to disseminate tools for people working on underdetermined problems. Okay, one thing that's very interesting. Yeah, it's sparselab.stanford.edu. I hesitate to say it because it's like it's 2005, but, you, but it still works, and you can go use it and install it in MATLAB and so on. Um, uh, I think there's a very interesting symbiotic relationship that has come up in some of the licensing discussions about uh, open source software as a collaborative model for science. So there's many differences, but we don't, we don't learn from things that, that they do to do software development as scientists, and there's an opportunity there for us. So they have um, uh, ways that they organize their collaboration that um, perhaps could be useful for some of our projects. And then the other thing that when I talk about this with people in the open source software world, they, people are interested in working on scientific problems and we don't facilitate any of this at all. Now, whether or not there's a role for them, that's up to individual investigators in the project and maybe, maybe in some cases there's not, but in, some, in many cases I could imagine there is. But we don't, I mean, the discussions we had yesterday of like, making a tarball and throwing it over the fence doesn't really create a, like facilitate a community to develop around that scientific problem. Continue, like, for example, how do they give back modifications they've made to the code or how do they ask questions? Where's the forum? And so there's, you know, sharing mo um, uh, modalities that we could really learn here that might allow other very talented citizens with um, extra cycles and talent to maybe get in and, and help. So that, that's one idea, and we, we don't take advantage of it. Okay, um, uh, quickly, so I think, I think most of this has come up, actually, on what different journals do. There's many different approaches uh, that are being tried out now, and then the last one is many journals are still ignoring the issue or just kind of waiting and see to see what other people are doing. And with any luck, this will come up in a very in-depth discussion tomorrow at the um, community forum. Okay, I wanted to talk, to some, talk about some of the challenges that, that I think about sometime. So the, the first one I called the Taleb effect, and I think um, Tony was touching on it in his comments earlier. So Nassim, the reason I call it the Taleb effect, Nassim Taleb had an article published on edge.org where he talks about these four quadrants of, um, I think he's actually talking about statistical science, but he, um, Pinpoints one is very dangerous, and he's talking about the financial crisis, and one's very dangerous when people have these tools that essentially they don't understand, right? And um, they can be uh, very um, impactful because, of course, people don't understand the effects or where it came from. And so you could imagine that happening in um, our community as well. 
uh, scientific discovery, like if, if we are more open and our work is much more accessible, particularly if um, code is released, it's very clear for the community what's going on. It may not be so clear for someone outside the community and they end up sort of with these, the same type of use of um, an extensive black box and all that comes with that. And I have seen um, even pieces of software, like this happened in uh, biology where in, in bioinformatics where they said they don't even want to share their software because they're, they think people won't know how to use it and it'll be misused and so on. So it's something that, that people think about. Um, another argument that people make is, well, suppose something happens in medical science and it's very open and people use it and results get out there that aren't what a scientist necessarily would have done, but it is very scary for the public. Or climate science, you could imagine something like that too. So there's this um, uh, possibility of, um, just to say, increased dialogue as you make the tools of um, creating results more available. Uh, so, I mean, this sometimes comes up in talks and my reaction to it is normally, or my reaction to it is that when we have these dialogues, I think the answer is really getting um, more information out there, responding or having more data and, um, and sort of allowing that dialogue to take place. Okay, so we already talked about giant co code bases, hundreds of thousands of lines and, and possible solutions. One thing that I'm interested in is, I uh, mentioned on, I think, the first slide, that there are intellectual contributions embedded in the software now. Um, as a statistician, I see that all the time when people have new stat statistical techniques and they're really in the code. Uh, and we all know that it's much easier to use someone else's code, you know, if it's well designed and works, than it is to rewrite uh, everything from scratch. So I wonder whether it makes adoption of new ideas slower having them embedded in software. So that's something that, it, that I just think about in the back of my mind because software is so so delicate and so breakable. Um, yeah, are we, as we make it easier to replicate our results, I should have changed that to reproducibility. Uh, is it, are we discouraging um, others from independently building the results from the ground up and actually um, verifying them that way? Um, what do we do with large data sets? And, um, and then how are we really involving the policymakers? Um, there are decisions that are, being taken that will affect us and our voices really being heard in there. And this is something that I think is increasingly um, an issue that we're going to have to pay attention to at, just as computational scientists. I think that, yeah, that's about all I had. Um, so there's references where some of this work has come from and, and um, uh, that I've written. So I'd be happy to take questions. necessarily in violet of what I've been saying uh, in the sense that that's also exceptional, right? They have this enormous amount of capital, right? And, and we, it, like, the idea of um, replication or reproducibility, I guess, is different for CERN anyway because we're not going to build another collider. So from the ground up, we're, we're already not doing anything in, in this sort of yeah, abstract so ideal sense. That's right. And so, so I gave a, a talk at CERN, um, I guess it's two summers ago now, and they raised this point that we have... Um, yeah, no, they love me. <laughs> 
that they have the independent silos in there that then are working on the same problem. So that's, that's their approach within their community. And one part is because of the tool, but they also have a large enough community where they can actually do that. Um, and then I remember a comment I got from the audience um, uh, that it, like I was talking about openness and they just said the idea, the idea that there's going to be you know, a meaningful contribution just from an average citizen based on open data, open code from CERN is laughable was the word they used. And it's, it's just essentially, um, at the, but that, that's not true for all scientific problems, right? And so it's just, it essentially points to the granularity of the problem that we're working on and why there really is no one size fits all solution here. But it's also one of the problems with the climate change where you have everybody's converged on a sort of single model and there really isn't quite the independence in my life. Yeah, I think that's changing though as we get more open with climate science, which I think, personally, I think will accelerate climate science. Yes, Tiffany. Yeah, I'm just curious. You listen to a lot of different um, reproducibility um, research conferences, and I was curious if you knew any additional ones. There, because I was lucky that you know you kind of contacted me. Otherwise, I wouldn't have known. But if you, yeah. you know, you seem so like connected. So if you knew of any other ones that are coming. Well, I, I, I hate to admit it. I was involved in a number, of, not all of them, but in a number of those. That's how I knew about them. Um, well, so we were going to, one thing that Ian and I were talking about discussing maybe during the break was how do we foment a community here and sort of stay in touch and so um, the m minimum thing we can do is a mailing list and I can let people know whenever I hear about anything or, or so on. But off the top of my head I don't know of anything right now but that probably means we should plan something. Yeah, I guess, you know, the staff is sort of in here, right? Yeah, yeah I agree. Yeah. Yes? So this morning, during the whole, a bunch of speakers were calling all the research is lazy. And I totally disagree. First of all, all of us knew it, particularly me last year, when I was doing research. So how can I call somebody lazy when the person doesn't even know what to do with research? No, that's right. So yeah, it's nice, you know, that like, we have more of these kind of conferences to inform people, you know, what it's about, rather than saying, you don't use what I'm putting there, so you're lazy. Well, I, I think the, the, I think the word lazy is a little strong, um, uh, but I think I think that it goes back to the slide where we had you know that blizzard of conferences. And my point was that there are independent groups now coming up all over and sort of talking about this, and we're gaining some momentum in the discussion. So I've been told, and I don't have personal experience with this, but. Um, that on evaluation committees, uh, tenure, promotion committee, hiring committees now, there does seem to be, at least in statistics, there seems to be an awareness of these issues uh, as candidates are evaluated. And so um, there seems to be a strength attributed to people who are aware of these issues than those that are somehow operating in some world completely innocent of everything we're talking about. So, but yeah, I, I'm interested in more marketing. That's true. Yeah. 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 Yeah, but I think for that it's also important to have kind of events around reproducible research in the other kinds of conferences because if we just organize yes. a reproducible right. research conference, That's right. that problem is not going to get solved. It, it, it indeed would be useful for many other things I think, but we're not going to, to reach other people or we'll, we'll probably reach a number of other people like there are a number of people here, but not like the big outside. No, well, that's right. That and one, one thing I've heard people suggest who are from different communities is they generally have one sort of premier conference a year. And so having something that happens before or after a workshop associated is, is probably the right way forward. Yeah, people have talked so about that. Well, that would be used for Providence, because Providence actually cuts across many different disciplines. Mm -hmm. That we have this workshop that we actually hold together with different conferences in different domains. So this year we found it together with the uh, SIGMA, which is databases. Uh, next year we're going to do it with Usenix, which is the uh, systems networking, whatever it is. Yeah. Right? So I try to do that and getting people involved in those communities. Yeah, that's great. So that may be something that uh, maybe you can make this a workshop that is kind of like repeatable. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a perfect note to end on. <laughs>